Hello everyone, this is The Historiographer. Today, we will be discovering the fascinating life and times of the Ottoman Empire's finest admiral, and one of, if not, history's greatest admirals, the man who saved tens of thousands of Muslim Andalusians from Spanish persecution and halted Catholic Habsburg aggression into North Africa, the man who won stunning victories against mighty fleets and transformed the Mediterranean Sea into an Ottoman lake. Meet Khairuddin Barbarossa. Khairuddin Barbarossa, as he would become known in his later years, was born as Khidr on the island of Lesbos, today's Greece, in 1476. His father was probably an Albanian cavalryman who was awarded a fiefdom in the island by Sultan Mehmed the Conqueror while his mother was a Greek native of the island. He had three elder brothers, Ishaq, Uruch, and Ilyas. His father purchased a boat by which they could sell their pottery throughout the Aegean Sea. His brother Uruch, who was a brilliant tradesman and seaman, sought to expand on his father's trading base from the Aegean Sea to the broader Mediterranean basin. Thus, Uruch and Ilyas set out on a trading endeavor to Tripoli and the Levant. While on their way, the trade ship of the brothers was attacked by the pirates of the infamous Knights Hospitalier, remnants since Crusader times, who made the island of Rhodos their base of operations, from which they would prey on Islamic trade ships in the eastern Mediterranean. In the brief raid, Ilyas was killed, while Oruç was taken into captivity. Upon hearing the news, Khidr was devastated. Nevertheless, Khidr helped liberate his brother Uruch from the hands of the Hospitalier after nearly three years of captivity. This experience changed the brothers, and Uruch traveled to the Mamluk Sultan of Egypt, offering him his services as a reis, or captain. In 1503, and after some brief time in the services of the Mamluk Sultan, Uruc and Khidr traveled together to the Hafsid Sultan of Tunis, asking him to grant them docking rights in the port of Lagoulet for their ships. To understand this crucial decision, we must take a step back and analyze the political situation in North Africa and in the broader Mediterranean. By 1415, Portugal had occupied the city of Ceuta from Morocco and fortified it, seeking to tap in on the crucial trade routes of West Africa and establish a base in North Africa. Similar efforts were undertaken in the Spanish Union, which controlled vast amounts of territory in the Mediterranean, such as the Balearic Islands, Sardinia, and the Kingdom of Naples in southern Italy. By 1492, the final Islamic stronghold in the Iberian Peninsula, the Emirate of Granada, fell to the Spaniards. That same year, Thousands of Jews were expelled to North Africa and to the Ottoman Empire by the Alhambra decree. At the same time, the Muslim population living in Andalusia was suffering under the Spanish Inquisition, which was a brutal method of forcing Muslims and Jews to leave their faith and convert to Christianity through horrific methods such as torture. Spain was eyeing the North African coast, taking the cities of Melilla, Oran, and Algiers by the start of the 16th century. Its neighbor to the north, the Kingdom of France, was locked in its own dynastic feuds, and the Valois kings were focused on centralization efforts. Meanwhile, northern Italy was home to various squabbling Italian city-states, while the Pope controlled Rome and territories in Romania since the times of Charlemagne. By this time, an interesting rivalry was occurring between the two Italian maritime trading republics, the Republic of Genoa and the Republic of Venice. Both had overseas territories and conducted trade with the various Islamic territories, mainly with Egypt to acquire the highly sought for Indian spices and silk in Europe. Speaking of Islamic territories, by the early 16th century, North Africa was home to the Marinid dynasty, which controlled the Sultanate of Morocco. The Wiccan Zainids, controlling the Emirate of Tlemcen and Algiers, and the Hafsid Sultan of Tunis, owning Tunis and parts of eastern Algeria and northern Libya. Egypt and the Levant was still under the rule of the ailing Mamluk Sultanate based in Cairo, 
while Anatolia and the Balkans were newly acquired by the rising Ottoman wave. The Aegean Sea harbored the notorious Knights Hospitalier, which were remnants of the last crusaders expelled from the Levant. These so-called knights turned into piracy and caused havoc in the eastern Mediterranean on both Mamluk and Ottoman shipping from their base of operations on the island of Rhodes. These were the same pirates that had captured Khairuddin's brother Oruç and executed his second brother Ilyas. Now that we have looked into the political situation, it is not hard to understand the motive behind the brothers Oruç and Khudr's joining to the Sultan of Tunis. In short, they wanted to act as a barrier and protect the Islamic inhabitants and cities of North Africa against the increasing incursions of the Christian powers and help the helpless sultanates and emirates of North Africa. In fact, here is an interesting quote from Barbarossa's own diaries. He told his brother Oroch when they arrived in Tunis, If death is the end of each human being, let it be for the sake of Allah. Thus, from 1504 till 1510, Oroch and his brother Khidr started rescuing operations which saved tens of thousands of Andalusian Muslims from the brutality of the Spanish Inquisition. At this time, the Europeans took to calling Oroch Barbaros, meaning the one with the red beard. Given that all of the brothers had crimson facial hair, the nickname stuck and was even used by the Turks themselves in the form of Barbaros to refer to the brothers. In 1509, Ishaq, the eldest brother, also left the island of Lesbos and joined his brothers at La Goulette port in Tunis. In 1510, the three brothers raided Sicily and repulsed Spanish attacks on the cities of Bejaia, Oran and Algiers in the Algerian coast. In August 1511, they responded to the Spanish attacks by raiding the area around Calabria in southern Italy. In the autumn of 1512, the exiled Muslim ruler of Bejaia asked the brothers to drive out the Spaniards and during the battle, Oroch Reis lost his left arm. Later that same year, the brothers raided the coasts of Andalusia, landed at the island of Minorca, and captured the coastal castle, and then headed towards Liguria in Genoa, where they raided the hinterlands and captured four Genoese galleys. The Genoese sent a fleet to liberate their ships, but the brothers captured the flagship as well. After capturing a total of 23 ships in less than a month, the brothers sailed back to La Goulette, where they built three more galleots and a gunpowder production facility. In 1513, they launched several successful raids on Valencia, Alicante, and Malaga, capturing five ships in the process. From 1513 to 1514, the brothers engaged the Spanish fleet on several occasions and moved to their new base in Churchill, just east of Spanish-occupied Algiers. In 1514, with 12 galleots and a thousand Turks, they destroyed two Spanish fortresses at Bejaia, and when another Spanish fleet arrived as reinforcements, they ambushed and crushed them. By now, Orochreitz had realized that he could not take on the mighty Spanish Empire all by himself. Thus, he started to build favors with the Ottomans to enhance his diplomatic position and gain an edge over the Spanish Empire. In fact, in 1515, Oruch sent a precious gift to the Ottoman Sultan Selim I, who, in return, sent him two galleys and two swords encrusted with diamonds in return. In 1516, the three brothers finally succeeded in recapturing the city of Algiers from the Spaniards after a tense assault. This gave them unprecedented prestige and fame in the Muslim world, and with each victory, their prestige grew more and more. Eventually, the Barbarossas assumed full control over the city and the surrounding region. The Spanish exiled garrison of Algiers sought refuge on the island of Pignon in the Mediterranean, and asked Charles V, King of Spain and Holy Roman Emperor, to intervene. But the Spanish fleet, which had been sent by the Emperor, failed to expel the brothers from Algiers. After consolidating his power and being asked to become the ruler of the Emirate of Algiers by the elite of the city, 
Uruch sought to expand this territory inland to create a greater buffer zone into which they could possibly retreat in case of Spanish attack. For Uruch, the best protection against Spain was to join the Ottoman Empire, his homeland and Spain's main rival, which was a move he was planning on for years. For this, he had to relinquish his title of the ruler of Algiers to the Ottomans. He did this in 1570 and offered Algiers to the Ottoman Sultan Selim I. The Sultan, who had just conquered the Levant, the Hejaz, and Egypt from the dying Mamluk Sultanate and proclaimed himself Caliph of all Muslims, had by now become acquainted with the Barbarossas. Consequently, he accepted Algiers as an Ottoman Sanjak and appointed Oruch governor of Algiers and chief sea governor of the West Mediterranean. Most importantly, however, Sultan Selim promised to support the brothers with Janissaries, which were elite Ottoman troops, galleys, cannons, and gunpowder. Oruch Reis now set his sight on the city of Tellemsan and succeeded in capturing it from the Spanish in 1517. However, he and his eldest brother, Ishaq, lost their lives in the defense of the city later that year after a Spanish counter-attack. After the death of his brothers, Khidr Reis was now given the title of Baylor Bey by Sultan Selim I, and he inherited his brother's position, his name, Barbarossa, and his mission to save North Africa against the unrelating waves of Catholic assaults. Barbarossa used his newfound powers as a pasha in Baylor Bay of Algiers and continued the evacuation of Muslim Andalusians from Spain to North Africa. Thus, he gained a sizable and a grateful manpower pool. Khair al-Din, seeking to secure his domain, finally recaptured the city of Tellemsan from the Spanish in December 1518, the city of Hanaba the next year, and with a fresh force of Turkish soldiers sent by the Ottoman Sultan, he defeated a Spanish force sent to recapture Algiers. In response to the Habsburg attacks, Barbarossa went on the offensive. Indeed, he sank a Spanish ship and captured eight others near the Straits of Gibraltar. By late 1520, Sultan Selim had died and was succeeded by his son, Suleiman I. The new 26-year-old Sultan, energetic and cunning, was determined to prove himself. Thus, after defeating a minor rebellion by the governor of Syria and securing his rule, he led his armies to the Serbo-Hungarian city of Belgrade, which lied on the banks of the Danube River. The city which had successfully defended against an attack by Mehmed the Conqueror, Suleiman's great-grandfather in 1456, and had for so long acted as a barrier to Ottoman expansion in the Hungarian plateau. Nevertheless, Belgrade was captured in August of 1521, earning the young Sultan a great deal of prestige and fame. When Suleiman returned to Constantinople, he started working with his vizier and trusted friend Ibrahim Pasha on a plan to conquer the impregnable island of Rhodes and rid the eastern Mediterranean of the piracy of the Knights, which were a thorn in the Ottoman side for more than a century. In the Ottoman court's eyes, Rhodes had to be captured in order to secure the empire's back and finally establish full control over the eastern Mediterranean. After a year of meticulous planning, Suleiman landed with a fleet of more than 400 ships and 100,000 men on the island. Khair al-Din Barbarossa, seeking to finally oust his old foes from the island, did not miss the chance to contribute to the war efforts. Indeed, he sailed from Algiers with a fleet of 20 warships to Rhodes, and after a grueling siege of 5 months, the fortress of Rhodes was finally captured by December of 1522, ending a century of piracy in the eastern Mediterranean basin. In the subsequent years, Khair al-Din Barbarossa strengthened his position in Algeria and crushed minor rebellions, while simultaneously sending his admirals to raid Spanish coastal cities and transport the thousands of Andalusians hiding in the Spanish hinterlands. After fully securing his position, 
he finally set his sight on the rock of Pinyon, which was only 300 meters away from the city of Algiers, and presented a major threat to the city's inhabitants. In May of 1529, he succeeded in capturing the Spanish fort on the island of Pinyon, after a 20-day bombardment. The 700-strong Spanish garrison surrendered, and he used the rubble to construct fortifications on the harbor of Algiers. Barbarossa then spent the rest of 1529 transporting thousands of Andalusians. In total, seven sorties were conducted by Barbarossa. Many sources agree that the total number of Andalusians that were transported to Algiers was over 70,000 people. Barbarossa later settled these refugees in Algeria and gave them agricultural land to cultivate. Due to these relentless expeditions, the people of Andalusia and North Africa bestowed upon him the nickname Khair din meaning the good of the faith, which is another title he would become known by. The fall of the Rock of Pinyon came as a shock to the Spanish efforts, and by now, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor and King of Spain, was sick of Barbarossa and his constant raids and resistance. In 1530, seeking to eliminate Barbarossa and recapture Algiers, the Emperor sent Andrea Doria, a Genoese admiral, at the head of a combined Spanish Genoese fleet of 40 galleys. Andrea Doria's fleet was intercepted by Barbarossa who had expected such a move, and Doria was forced to retreat. In response to the attacks, Khairiddin raided the coasts of southern Italy and liberated the town of Tripoli in Libya from the Knights Hospitali, who now made the island of Malta their new base of operations after being expelled from Rhodes in 1522. Barbarossa then proceeded to raid the coast of Andalusia and finally returned to Algiers by mid-1531. During Suleiman I's expedition to Habsburg, Austria in 1532, Andrea Doria captured many cities from the Ottoman Empire on the coast of southern Greece. These Greek cities were retaken by Suleiman, but the event made the Sultan realize the importance of having a powerful commander at sea. He thus summoned Barbarossa to Istanbul, who arrived at the imperial city later that year after leaving his adopted son, Hassan Reyes, in his place. Upon arriving, Barbarossa was made Capodani Deria of the Ottoman fleets, which is the highest possible naval rank in the Ottoman Empire. As the captain of the fleet, he became a member of the Diwan of the Sultan, or the Council of Ministers of the Ottoman Empire, and the Sultan granted him wide powers with regard to shipbuilding and the organization of the fleet. The sources mention that Khair din became the closest advisor to the Sultan during this time. Relying on his experience, Khair din started by ordering the shipbuilding factories in Istanbul to build 61 ship hulls in a short period of time. Sultan Suleiman greatly supported Khair din with his naval strategy, and Barbarossa's policy was summarized in quality over quantity. He thus revolutionized the Ottoman arsenal by building warships with cannons that have a greater range and by selling the old ships. By the 1530s, the Hafsid Sultanate of Tunis had become a strategic choke point in the Mediterranean Sea. Controlling Tunis would mean for the Ottomans a land connection from the lands in Libya and Egypt to Algeria. Inversely, the Spanish sought to control Tunis by whatever means, to keep the Ottoman armies away from Spain, and to re-establish their lost dominance in the West Mediterranean. Thus, in order to keep Spanish eyes away from attacking Tunis, Barbarossa planned a diversionary attack to divert Spanish forces and only then would he be able to rapidly capture Tunis. He thus embarked on one of his most famous and ingenious raids, the raid which would capture Spanish possessions in the Adriatic Sea, Italy, and even threaten the Catholic holy city of Rome itself. Indeed, in 1534, and after nearly a year and a half in Istanbul, Barbarossa set sail from the imperial city with 80 newly built galleys. Not long after, he recaptured the Greek cities of Coroni, Patras, and Lepanto from the Spaniards in the Peloponnese. Then, in July 1534, he set his sight on the Italian peninsula. 
He daringly crossed the Strait of Messana and raided the coast of Calabria, capturing a huge number of ships there. In the same month, Khairuddin appeared with his fleet near the city of Napoli and bombarded its ports. Barbarossa then made his way up the Tyrrhenian Sea and landed at the city of Ostia, which was only 30 kilometers away from Rome, causing the church bells in the Pope's city to sound the alarm. Panic and confusion spread, and many were frightened that Barbarossa was going to sail up the river Tiber to reach Rome, but the raid had achieved its intended objectives. The Spanish forces were confused and in disarray, and more and more cities were hastily garrisoned in all of the Spanish possessions, thus splitting Spanish resources. Barbarossa, judging the time to be right, quickly set sail to Tunis, but on his way, he raided the coasts of Sicily to confuse the Spaniards. At this moment, he split up his forces. Barbarossa sent back 40 ships which were packed of spoils to Istanbul and kept only 40 warships for the Tunis operation. By August of 1534, Barbarossa finally docked his ships in the port of La Goulette. As soon as he reached Tunis, the people came out to receive him. However, the Hafsid Sultan, Maulay al-Hassan, fled Tunisia and sought the help of the Emperor Charles V to restore his throne. Charles first dispatched an agent to offer Barbarossa the Lordship of North Africa for his exchanged loyalty, or if that failed, to assassinate him. However, Barbarossa knew about the plot and, upon rejecting the offer, he killed the Spanish agent. Charles, who was furious and eager to take revenge on Khairuddin, pounced upon the presented opportunity. In fact, the emperor set sail from Barcelona in August 1535 with 24,000 troops and 300 ships. Khairuddin's forces, who only numbered around 10,000 men, tried to hold out as much as possible and inflicted massive losses to the Spaniards. But Barbarossa was forced to retreat from Tunis due to the futility of armed resistance. When Charles entered the city, he carried out a massacre where 30,000 were killed, and it is documented that the stench of the corpses was such that Charles V soon left the city of Tunis. As a result of the campaign, the Hafsids relinquished La Goulette and Benzer to the Spaniards, were forced to pay an annual tribute of 12,000 golden ducats and allowed them to reside freely throughout the country. In short, Tunis was made a Spanish protectorate. Barbarossa withdrew to Algeria, and from there he set out in 32 naval warships to the Bilaric archipelago. He completely destroyed the Spanish ports of Minorca and Majorca. Then, seeking to punish the Portuguese for their participation in the attack on Tunis, he sailed through the Straits of Gibraltar and sabotaged the port of Faro in southern Portugal. In September 1535, he repulsed another Spanish attack on the city of Tellemsa. When the storm had finally settled, he departed Algeria by late 1535 and left his son Hassan Reyes in his place. With his departure from Algeria this time, his life became linked not only to North Africa, but to Ottoman history. In August of 1537, Barbarossa led a huge Ottoman force that captured all of the Aegean and Ionian islands belonging to the Republic of Venice. In the same year, Barbarossa raided the island of Corfu and completely destroyed the agricultural cultivations on the island. These losses prompted Venice to ask Pope Paul III to organize an alliance against the Ottomans, aiming to hold the lightning-fast naval and land conquests of the seemingly unstoppable Ottoman Empire. After nearly six months of political maneuvering, Pope Paul III succeeded in assembling an alliance which he christened the Holy League in February of 1538. This alliance comprised the Papacy, Spain, Portugal, the Holy Roman Empire, the Republic of Venice, the Republic of Genoa, and the Maltese Knights, all united against the unrelenting Ottoman wave.
Without a single doubt, the Holy League was the greatest military challenge Barbarossa would ever face in his career, and in summer of 1538, fate would bring Khair din to face his old foe Andrea Doria once again, who now commanded the Great Christian Coalition which gathered near the island of Corfu. In total, the Holy League had 302 ships and 60,000 soldiers, including 50 large galleons which were huge ships that relied upon the wind for navigation, 112 mid-sized galleys which relied both upon the wind and rowing, and 140 smaller barks. Meanwhile, Khair din gathered his forces near the island of Kos in the Aegean Sea. His fleet consisted of 112 galleys and 12,000 soldiers. He was at number 3 to 1, but his vessels did not primarily rely on wind, like the bulk of the European fleet, which consisted of barks and galleons, but rather they were rowed, thus giving the Ottoman fleet greater maneuverability. Barbarossa sailed his fleet up the western coast of Greece, and then quickly entered the Ambracian Gulf. His right flank was secured by the Ottoman fortress at Previsi, which could support the Ottoman fleet by cannon fire at any time, while his left flank at Actium was protected by Ottoman cannons and some soldiers that were disembarked from his ships. By now, Andrea Doria had realized the strong position and land advantage of Barbarossa. On the 25th and 26th of September, two sorties were sent to try and occupy the fortress of Previsa, but both of them were repulsed. Thus, Andrea Doria, fearing the late seasonal winds which could potentially put his fleet in a weak position, and after realizing that he could not attack Barbarossa's well-entrenched fleet head-on, ordered his ships to sail 40 kilometers south to dock near the island of Nepkida. He also figured that the numerically inferior Ottoman fleet would not dare to attack him either. Doria's plan was simple. He had to attack the city of Lepanto to force Barbarossa out of his fortified position. However, the coordination of a fleet of more than 300 ships from multiple nations was logistically both difficult and slow. Indeed, the plan proved to be a massive mistake as Barbarossa took the chance and exited out of his position at dawn. Andrea Doria was surprised to see that the Turks were coming towards his ships. Nobody in the Allied Armada expected such a daring offensive from the numerically inferior Ottoman fleet. Furthermore, the Holy League's fleet was heavily overextended, with Doria's Spanish Genoese fleet 16 kilometers away from the Venetian, Papal, and Malti squadrons who would be the first to be attacked. The Ottoman fleet was shaped in a crescent-like formation, while the Christian fleet consisted of multiple lines of ships. The two armadas finally engaged on the afternoon of 28 September 1538, and the fighting began. The Ottomans first bombarded the coalition's ships with their modernized cannons that had a greater range than their European counterparts, and would prove essential to their victory in the battle. After the bombardment, Barbarossa swiftly engaged the Venetian, Papal, and Maltese ships which were at the forefront but Doria hesitated to bring his center into action against Barbarossa, which led to much tactical maneuvering but little fighting. Barbarossa wanted to take advantage of the lack of wind which had rendered the Christian barks immobile on the windless seas. These barks fell as easy prey to the Turks, who bombarded them with their more mobile galleys. The battle lasted for five hours, and at the end of the day, the Ottomans sunk, destroyed, or captured 128 ships and had taken 3,000 prisoners. Khairuddin Barbarossa did not lose a single ship, though some were critically damaged. Barbarossa's fleet suffered 400 dead and 800 wounded. The next morning, with favorable winds and unwilling to risk his Spanish Genoese ships, Andrea Doria set sail and left the battlefield deaf to the pleas of the Venetian, Papal, and Maltese commanders to continue the fighting. Just like that, the Ottoman Empire became the undisputed master of the Eastern Mediterranean base, and Khair din Barbarossa won the day thanks to his tactical brilliance, his situational awareness, 
his masterful choice of vessels before the battle, and his modernization efforts to the Ottoman navy. When the dust had finally settled, Barbarossa immediately dispatched a message to Sultan Suleiman, informing him of the Ottoman victory over the Holy League. Victory was declared in all of the Ottoman domains. The defeat in the Battle of Previza had shaken the alliance of the Holy League. Distrust between the Holy League's members was growing day by day as a result of the defeat in the fateful battle. In fact, many put the blame on Andrea Doria, the Genoese admiral, who was defeated by the Ottomans. It is widely speculated that, as a loyal Genoese, Andrea Doria was simply unwilling to risk his own Spanish Genoese ships due to his long-standing enmity towards Venice, which was after all his home city's fierce rival. In any case, the only force which kept the Holy League's forces alive after the disastrous Battle of Previza was the Emperor Charles V himself. Indeed, Charles sought to breathe a new life into the crumbling alliance by ordering Andrea Doria to seize the city of Castelnovo from the Ottomans. His aim was to try and contest Ottoman control once again in the East Mediterranean. Andrea Doria captured the city from the Ottomans only 10 days after the Battle of Previza in October of 1538. In the summer of 1539, Barbarossa was ordered by Sultan Suleiman to set sail to the Adriatic Sea with a fleet of 200 ships and 14,000 troops, including 4,000 elite Janissaries, in order to recapture the strategic fortress of Castelnovo in modern-day Montenegro. Barbarossa arrived on the 12th of June 1539 and offered an honorable surrender to the Spanish commander, a man by the name of Fernando de Samiento who commanded 3,500 troops. However, the offer was refused. Thus, the city and its fortress were besieged for 20 days by land and sea. After heavy artillery bombardment, Barbarossa was finally able to retake it on August of 1539. Barbarossa later took the remaining Christian outposts in the Ionian and Aegean seas. Recognizing the danger the Ottoman Empire presented, and after much deliberation in the Venetian Senate, the Republic of Venice had decided that peace was the best option. And so, Venice finally signed a peace treaty with Sultan Suleiman in October of 1540, agreeing to recognize all of the Ottoman territorial gains in the Aegean and Ionian seas, and to pay 300,000 gold ducats to the Sublime Port. This victory reaffirmed Ottoman hegemony in the Eastern Mediterranean once and for all. In September of 1540, Charles V secretly sent a delegation to Barbarossa in Istanbul, offering him once again the position of commander of the Spanish fleet in the Mediterranean Sea and the ruler of all of the Spanish possessions in North Africa. However, Khair din Barbarossa not only refused the offer, but the Spanish envoy was arrested. Thus, all of the efforts of the Spanish emperor to persuade Barbarossa had failed. With the end of 1540, perhaps nobody was more infuriated in Europe than the emperor Charles V, as the Republic of Venice had betrayed him, signed a peace treaty with the Ottomans, and had left the Holy League which it had itself initiated. Furthermore, he failed in accomplishing any of his goals, as well as suffering a humiliating defeat in the Battle of Previza and in the recapture of Castelnovo. Finally, he failed in persuading Barbarossa to change sides and join his cause. The pride of the mighty emperor could not accept this outcome, and Charles was determined to respond. Thus, he rushed in secret to mobilize a massive fleet with the help of the remaining states and the Holy League in order to capture Ottoman Algeria, which was a thorn in the Spanish side for over 30 years now. Indeed, 500 warships carrying 24,000 troops were assembled, and the effort was declared a crusade by the Pope himself. However, the season was not ideal for such a campaign, and both Andrea Doria, who commanded the fleet, and Hernan Cortes, the Spanish conqueror of Mexico, 
attempted to change the emperor's mind, but both of them failed to do so. Charles was determined to lead the crusade himself. Indeed, on the 23rd of October 1541, Charles landed with his army in the Gulf of Algiers after parading his huge fleet for two days in the sea in front of the city. Then, he started siege preparations. However, a fierce storm blew at night, which sunk many ships, decimated the Spanish supplies, and drew in the gunpowder, thus rendering the cannons useless. Charles, now hoping to save face, ordered the general attack on the city of Algiers, but the 6,000 strong Ottoman garrison, led by Hassan Reyes, held strong. Thus, due to the disastrous weather, and after much deliberation with his admirals, Charles V was forced to retreat with the remainder of his fleet. In any case, the campaign had lasted only 12 days, and had resulted in 12,000 dead, drowned and captured, and the loss of 200 Spanish ships. Hayreddin Barbarossa departed with a considerable fleet from Istanbul to save Algeria, but he arrived after the withdrawal of Charles. So he stayed for a short period to shore up the defenses of Algeria, and then raided the Spanish and Italian coasts in response to the doomed expedition. One of the results of this campaign was that the Holy League was permanently broken, and the Emperor, Charles V, not only gave up on his plans to conquer Algeria, but rather he completely refrained from competing with the Ottoman Empire for control over the western Mediterranean basin. The Spanish influence was no longer as significant in North Africa, and this campaign marked the beginning of the final liquidation of the Spanish presence in North Africa. And from here comes the saying that the Mediterranean Sea became an Ottoman lake in the 16th century. Barbarossa retired in Istanbul in 1545 after leaving his son Hassan Pasha as his successor in Algeria. Sultan Suleiman, who was intrigued by such a man, asked him to write down his own diaries to explain how he had captured Algiers from the Spaniards with his brother Oruç back in 1516, how he saved the Andalusian population, how he won the Battle of Previza, and all of his life achievements. Indeed, he wrote his memoirs which consist of five handwritten volumes known as Gazavati Hayriddin Pasha, which mean the conquest of Hayriddin Pasha. Barbarossa's memoirs remain a crucial source for historians and provide a fascinating first-hand insight into the political, social, cultural, and military situation in the first half of the 16th century. Hayriddin Barbarossa died in 1546 in his seaside palace in Istanbul. He is buried in a mausoleum near the ferry port of the district of Besiktas on the European side of Istanbul, at exactly the same site where his mighty fleets used to assemble. And thus, we end our series on Khairiddin Barbarossa. Thank you for watching and subscribe to not miss out on our future endeavors, as we are planning to cover other intriguing events in the world's history.